Hello everyone, I'm Reese. And I'm Kelsey. And you're listening to Charismatic Megafauna. So basically the idea behind this podcast is that Kelsey and I get together and discuss uh, topics mostly in the realm of science, I would say. Sometimes pop culture. Yeah, that's that's really my contribution to <laughs> the pop culture. Um, and we record it and put it on the, on the internet for you to listen to. Lucky you. Yeah, right. I, I think it's important also to note that uh, neither of us are experts, remotely experts at all. We are armchair professionals. We are. Yeah, absolutely. We j- we're just uh, interested in this stuff. So. so we hope that we can foster some of that interest in you. Absolutely. So let's get into it. Sounds good to me. Kelsey, what uh, did you learn this week? So basically, my favorite thing about this week was I learned, I'm just going to give you the title of the article because I think that says enough about it. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. (laughs) Disneyland's fake rainforest is pretty real. I'm sorry. Read that to me one more time. All right. Disneyland's Mm -hmm. fake rainforest is pretty real. Okay. Do they mean realistic or do they mean it's a real rainforest? Oh, hang on tight. Okay. We're going to jump right in. <laughs> okay. Getting ahead here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell me what it's about. So this is Disneyland, which is in Anaheim, California, mm-hmm. which you've been to, correct, Reese? I have, yeah. Basically, it started, I think, in 1955, where they had the Wild Kingdom, the rainforest. I think you go through on a boat, maybe. Reese, you would know better than me. I don't know. I didn't do that part, actually. Oh, well. Why I did Space Mountain about this? 50 times, and then we went home. <laughs> Anyways, about 50 years ago, they began replacing the foliage along this passage. It began as orange trees, and now they've switched it to basically rainforest trees, I guess you could call them. Things like ficus and bamboo, and I think there's a coral tree, a whole variety of trees that grow in the rainforest, you know, near the equator. Sure. And what the, I almost said herbologist, this is not a Harry Potter podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Though it could easily turn into one at some point. I'm I'm sure sure it will at some point. What the horticulturist of Disneyland had to say about it is that basically it's become its own self-sustained ecosystem. There are trees that are up to 100 feet tall and they're behaving like a rainforest would behave. So what I mean by that is that these trees have developed their own insulating ability. They survive cold snaps. So when it goes below freezing, it's warm enough inside this rainforest that they keep themselves alive, basically. That's crazy. So they've essentially recreated some of the conditions. Yeah, accidentally, Yeah. which I think says a lot about our ability yeah. to control nature, that oh, yeah. we can't do it on purpose. Yeah. Right. It well, or like predicting the weather is that, well, don't even get Yeah, no, we're not even going to get you started on that. But I was reading more into it, and the horticulturist was saying that it's reached a point where they're not even really pruning unless the trees are getting in the way of the animatronics, and they're leaving fallen leaves and fallen trees to create nutrient cycling in the soil, which is what happens in the rainforest, because I believe leaves from the rainforest trees are really high in nitrogen. Yeah. I, I think you're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any idea? No, no idea. <laughs> I think it might be oxygen that you're thinking of. Oxygen? But I, oxygen. <laughs> my sh- I broke into Connery for a second. There. That's okay. It happens to the best of us. Yeah. But I found that super fun that we've created this ecosystem that Disney, which is its own beast, has created an ecosystem by accident. And if you talk to some of the people who work there, I mean, some of the people who are in charge of, I guess... You could call them tour guides, but I don't think that they're really tour guides. Yeah. But they're part of the whole experience, and they say that they've seen bizarre spiders, and they've seen all kinds of crazy stuff, and once they get into the boats and they go through the rainforest, that it rises a couple of degrees at least. I think that's so interesting. Yeah, that's that's really cool. And that they don't have to spend any money maintaining it. And uh, it also furthers my theory that Disney is slowly taking over the world. Oh, that's less of a theory in more <laughs> real life nowadays. Yeah, they're essentially a giant like supervillain. But anyways, that's what I found super interesting this week. Yeah, that's re- that's really cool. Uh, it's it 
kind of blows your mind that we can sort of recreate. Well, not not we, Disney, <laughs> can sort of recreate those conditions. Yeah, again, by accident. By accident. Or is it really by accident? I mean, the horticulturists seem to think so. You mean the herbologist? <laughs> I do mean the herbologist. Now that we've confused all of you by opening up our science podcast with talks of Disneyland, I would love to move on to our main topic, which today I'm going to talk about where our name came from, what charismatic megafauna are, and all of the basics that go into what inspired our podcast. Cool. I'm, I'm interested to hear this. Yeah. So charismatic megafauna can also be called flagship species, and it is basically just a big animal that attracts a lot of attention. It's something a lot of people care about. Think about tigers or elephants or dolphins. It's something that has a lot of charisma and that humans feel a pretty strong attachment to. The popular kids. Right. The The popular kids of the animal kingdom. But charismatic megafauna goes back to about the 80s. That's the first time I saw mention of it. Using the phrase charismatic megafauna, flagship species have been around for a long time. But the new, more exciting name of charismatic megafauna is about only about 30 years old. The idea, like I said, goes back even further than that, though. It's, it was a big part of what inspired the Endangered Species Act. I don't think that it would have been passed if there hadn't been these big, beautiful animals to convince Congress needed saving. But we'll talk more about the Endangered Species Act at another point. There's enough to do an entire podcast on that. So stick around, because then you'll get to hear about legislature. Yeah. It's, fa- it's a fast-paced world. <laughs> <laughs> but charismatic megafauna, the whole concept, is very important in the animal kingdom. It's very important for the protection of a variety of species, not only the species that you're trying to save. For example, if you donate a bunch of money to protect Tigers, you have to protect the tiger's habitat, you have to protect what the tiger eats, and then you have to protect what the tiger eats, what they're eating. So by donating Mm. money to this one big, beautiful animal, you're actually contributing to a huge, huge overhaul of protecting their environment and protecting all of the other species that exist in that environment. It has sort of a sort of a ripple effect. Yeah, I believe it's called an umbrella effect, Mm. umbrella species. A trickle down effect trickle down effect exactly we all know how well that works yeah right very popular in the circles i think that that donate money to these large (laughs) the conservation of these habitats and oh yeah donating money to these things can protect them on a wide scale that's all i was saying now most of these animals most of the charismatic megafauna are actually mammals which I've always found interesting because mammals make up less than 10% of all the vertebrates in the world. And I think it's less than a half percent of all of the animals in the world. That's crazy. Yeah. So what would, (laughs) stupid question, what what would make up the rest? There are no stupid questions on the Charismatic Megafauna podcast. Just stupid people. (laughs) (laughs) No comment. Yeah. Most of the animals living right now are invertebrates. I think it's something like over 95%. Wow. So that would be like bugs. And, bugs and stuff. You know, jellyfish. <laughs> yeah. Right? Bugs is, and jellyfish. Is that wrong? <laughs> okay. No, that's right. Yeah. All right. But the mammals are the most understood and studied of these groups. Yeah. And it's partially because we feel a great attachment to mammals. A lot of times they're really big. They're really beautiful. It's the kind of animals that you think of when you think of these, I mean, any animal, like if you ask people their favorite animal, it's going to be a mammal 90% of the time. Right. That can cause some problems. Like what's your, what's your favorite animal? Well, my favorite animal is megabats. Megabats. I have. Mammals actually. Yeah. 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 I mean, bats are mammals. Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. I'm a sellout. (laughs) My favorite animal is a dyak fruit bat actually. They're endemic to Southeast Asia, and I would love to do long-term research with them. And I mean, bats are kind of the invertebrates of the mammal world. People don't like bats. In the, I was going to say in the way that uh, that people aren't like people are sort of creeped out by bats. Yeah, 
Which I understand. They can yeah. be pretty creepy. Yeah. Well, you know, vampires, I'm sure, have not <laughs> helped, helped their reputation. No. Vampires have ruined the bat PR circuit. <laughs> I know. Unbelievable. This bit. You, get, <laughs> you get one guy who just ruins it for everybody. He ruins it for all of us. Thanks, Lugosi. <laughs> <laughs> As we were saying, bats are something that are important to me. But even animals like bats don't get a whole lot of donations. They don't get a whole lot of the research dollars. The animals that are getting those research dollars are the charismatic megafauna. And that's, I mean, I mentioned it a little bit before, but it's because we're interested in saving these animals and we believe that they have an inherent value, even if they don't really have a biological value in an ecosystem. But I think that it's important to consider all of, all of the animals we do all this research on mammals and we know most of what there is to know about them. I you're, mean, you're saying not just the charismatic megafauna. Yeah, yeah. I think it would be important to expand into things like yeah. bats, but that's only because I like bats, right. but also invertebrates. Yeah. Almost nobody studies invertebrates and people who do are considered odd. Yeah. Well, by a lot of science. Invertebrates are, you know, creepy. Jellyfish are super cool. Yeah, they're terrifying, too. Talk about the aliens of the ocean, <laughs> by the way. Pretty much, yeah. Box jellyfish is, like, my my biggest fear in the world. <laughs> Why? I, they can ascend, like... <laughs> I, forget, I forget what the fact is. And I, now we have Reese Remembers Facts. Yeah. <laughs> Reese's Alternative Facts Corner. <laughs> um, box jellyfish can, can ascend, like... At, at like two to three hundred miles an hour or something like that up through the ocean. That doesn't sound right. No, <laughs> it doesn't. But that's why it's so terrifying because it's like I was watching, uh, I think it was probably the Discovery Channel or something. Oh, I'm sure. And they were they were talking about box jellyfish. And I that's when I realized that I, there is nothing I'm more terrified of than just, you know, swimming along like the chicken jaws and then two seconds later... Some jellyfish that was at the bottom of the ocean just descends and <laughs> stings me to death. <laughs> the ocean is terrifying. Yeah. Oh, no. It's full of those those kind of things. But I think it's still important to study those. Yeah. But I, nobody else thinks so. Not nobody else. No. I'm <laughs> but nobody giving money to research projects. No. It's because they're creepy and they're all afraid of animals like box jellyfish <laughs> you're the kind of person who donates money to these things yeah right because I, I would i would absolutely donate money to charismatic megafauna like an elephant or a tiger or something oh yeah but, but if it's like save the jellyfish <laughs> it's scare me a little bit <laughs> reese what's your favorite animal my favorite animal has to be the red panda oh yeah no red panda's perfect yeah. i love red pandas adorable here we go, perpetuating that belief, too, that mammals are better than other animals. Well, I work with birds. Yeah. And I still like mammals better. Yeah. But you have to wonder if it's because so much money has been put into research on these animals because we know so much about them. I mean, ask a kid under 10 to talk about their favorite animal. Yeah. And if it's a tiger or, you know, a polar bear or anything along those lines, they're going to know everything there is to know about it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think there's also probably... Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's there's an element of uh, like relatability there, being that we are sort of the um, large um, and in charge. La- <laughs> exact. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> we're just we're those mammals, that, and we can we can relate to other mammals in that same way. I think that's really true. Because yeah. even if you think about dogs, not so much wolves, but dogs can read our facial expressions and we can kind of read mammal facial expressions. Yeah. We can get a basic idea of what a lot of animals are thinking. Well, it's the, I mean, it's probably part of the reason that, that you know, basically half of the internet is cat videos. Oh, We just, yes. we like to personify our animals. Yeah. And it's hard to personify something like a fish. Yeah. Right. I know you don't like fish, do you? I don't trust them because they don't have, they can't blink. <laughs> I don't trust anything that can't blink. It's jellyfish, same exact thing. I think it's just specific fish that can't blink. I think it's like the fish that you typically see, like bony fish, like bass and sunnies and stuff. Well, yeah. Because sharks are, blink. In, in, you know, being from the Midwest, that's, you know. Oh, all the, all the fish you see can't blink. I don't trust sharks for a different reason, though. <laughs> 
they're the perfect form. They have not evolved in 50 million years or something like that. I know. I know. Just like crocodiles. But sharks are still really cool. And there are people doing research on sharks. But how many people are there doing research on mussels? Yeah. I can think of one off the top of my head. Dwayne the Rock Johnson. (laughs) Oh, that was really funny. That punny, you might say. Very punny. Yeah. I think we should get back to discussing charismatic megafauna. Oh, yeah. I was going <laughs> to I was going to say what are we talking about? <laughs> we lost we lost ourselves a little Got bit a little there, but off, that's okay. That's part of it. There. Let's see. Inspecting my notes. Oh, I was going to talk about how there is a negative side to this, and I was sort of alluding to it with the fact that so much research money is going towards animals that we know a lot about already. But it can also lead to, I guess you could call them pseudo fixes, where governments or a variety of different groups put management in place that ends up not working, either because they're eager to get something in place, to get a management policy in place, or because they like the idea of looking like you're helping, but they don't really want to put in all the effort that it would take to help these animals. What would that look like? Do you have an example? Um, I would say pandas is a good example. Because we don't need to get started about how I truly feel about pandas. Because a lot of people like pandas. How do you How do you feel about pandas? Not today. <laughs> Maybe I'll do a whole episode on my feelings on pandas. We can. We'll see if Jack Black will come on the show and defend pandas. Oh yeah, he might. He might. But pandas are a good example because yeah. we pulled pandas out of the wild because mm-hmm. they had completely run out of environment that they could live in in China. So we pulled a bunch out of the wild and we brought them into captive breeding programs. And I think the first captive breeding program started in the 80s with pandas. Okay. And in the 30 years it's been since they've started that program, I think only, I think less than 10 pandas have been released back out into the wild, even though they've bred like 400, 500 of them. Why would that be? Just because they're like, they become dependent on the people or what? I think it's partially that. I also think it's that Pandas have a really not well understood breeding pattern and they're very unsuccessful when they breed. So a combination of finding two pandas that are actually interested in one another and then having the female panda carry baby pandas to term. And then once they're born, they're being taken care of by people, regardless of the fact that they're people in panda masks. They're still people and I think that they just can't develop their own skills to be released. Sort of like millennials. Sort of like millennials. What do they eat, too? Aren't they allergic to their food? Well, they eat bamboo, primarily, I believe. And bamboo is, believe it or not, all fiber. Yeah. Not a whole lot of nutrients. Right. So they're eating, they're a bear, Mm -hmm. and they're eating like an elephant would eat, or like a horse would eat. But they should be eating like a bear would eat. Yeah. Yeah. And not, I mean, black bears eat a variety of foods, but you'd think that they should maybe be eating insects or something in addition. Yeah. And I don't know a lot about pandas, so maybe they do, but their primary diet is bamboo. Yeah. But that's why they've their numbers have decreased so severely is because they don't have any bamboo left. I mean, there's still some bamboo left, but not enough to sustain them. Hmm. Maybe they should uh, harvest some of the bamboo at Disneyland, ship it out to... That is a brilliant idea. I know. Problem solved. You're welcome, pandas. (laughs) But I want to think about how much money has been donated to pandas over the year. And pandas are the face of the World Wildlife Fund. Mm. Pandas are, by definition, probably the most charismatic megafauna. Yeah. And we've done almost nothing to reintroduce them, to get their numbers back up in the wild. It's been basically a failure. So it's just... Which can be a big downfall. That's all I was going to say. Yeah, no. Uh, Do you think that's a, uh, do you think the issue is, um, because people are obviously donating to pandas, right? Oh, yeah. And research and do you think it's an issue of like misallocation of funds? Like they take that money and they file it into something else that doesn't really help the pandas. I don't think so because I think panda breeding programs cost a lot of money. Yeah. I just think that we decided to jump right in to trying to save the pandas without knowing a whole lot about them. Yeah. About their mating practices, about what they need. 
when they're bearing young, but what they need when they are adults as they're being released. I just think that we didn't know enough when we started this program. Yeah. Which on the flip side, I'm trying to think of an example that has been relatively successful. And the only one that can come to mind is the bison. Yeah. Which is pertinent to Reese and I, because we live in the Midwest and there have been a lot of bison reintroduction programs in the U S especially in our portion of it. Yeah. What's the, uh, what's the park in Minnesota? I think it's Miniopa state park, Miniopa. which we mean to take a field trip to, because I would love to see some wild bison. Yeah. me too. But for the first time in, Oh, I don't know. hundred years, maybe more. The first wild bison was mm. born in Iowa just three years ago. I think 2014, no which kidding. is four years ago now, I guess. Wow. We're getting old. <laughs> but these programs are fantastic. They did a bunch of research mm-hmm. to understand what the bison need. And to be fair, bison are a little bit more hardy than the pandas are. Yeah. But they still need a variety of plants to eat and they still need a very large space to roam. So I think because in that case, we put science to the test first before we decided to just start throwing a bunch of bison onto the landscape. I think it made a huge difference because these reintroduction programs of the bison have been largely successful. And as I was talking about earlier, bison on the landscape are super important for prairie land. If I'm remembering correctly, I think bison eats, oh, I'm going to get it wrong. I think that they eat grasses, but they don't eat wildflowers. And I could be wrong on that. Okay. But basically what they do is they go through and they do sort of successive grazing where they'll graze this one area really intensely for a couple of weeks and then they move on to a new area. But I think they leave the wildflowers alone and then the wildflowers are allowed to seed out and create this much more adaptive ecosystem i guess you could say with a more a higher biodiversity a lot more plants on the landscape and then that allows them to basically beat down so that it's not just one big grass that's really successful on the landscape in the prairie land didn't you um i think you brought this up um, as part of uh, some homework for one of your classes i think but there's like a there's like a grazing succession right like yeah that's in africa yeah but it's basically the same thing. Just just Africa doesn't apply to like the prairies and stuff too? That's a good question. I don't think so. I think most of what the bison do is that they're grazing grasses, they're grazing a lot of invasive species, and it reduces the litter. So grasses die off every year. Most yeah. grasses die off every year and create these litter layers that can build up and then it causes too much nutrient too many nutrients in the store in the uh, ground layer in the soil. Mm. Uh, and then they, the grasses can't continue to grow. Whereas if the bison are eating those grasses, it really reduces the amount of litter and can create a more successful ecosystem. Okay. Interesting. Because they eat the correct amount. Right. It's all about balance. Everything's about balance. The circle of life, Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's all I really have to say about charismatic megafauna, unless you have any questions. Is there anything else you wanted to add? What, um, so, so give me some other examples. Cause I, I, like I have an idea of what they are in my head. It's like the pandas and the lions and stuff, but what, what would be considered like a, a charismatic megafauna sort of in, in our, uh, region of the world? In our region of the world, there's a lot less because people came over here in droves and murdered a lot of the big animals. Good. But I would say in the Midwest, Moose are a really big one, although with the direction we're heading, not going to be a whole lot of moose left, but what? Yeah. Moose cannot survive in the U S anymore. Why? It's getting too warm. There's a lot of diseases that are Mm. affecting them. There's not a lot of, I don't know if they're called fawns, but their young aren't surviving at a high enough rate, which I think they still are in Canada, but it's become a pretty big problem. Hmm. But I would say moose are a good example. It's a shame. Yeah. Wolves. Right? Wolves are I'm another thinking, one. I'm thinking of the uh, <clears throat> in, endangered species. Yeah. A lot of times there's a lot of overlap. Yeah. And I mentioned that we were going to talk about the Endangered Species Act. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of the endangered species uh, chocolate bars that we buy at the <laughs> co-op. <laughs> I apologize for misinterpreting. Yeah. 
what you meant. I was my and mine is much more serious than the Endangered Species Act. Obviously. Obviously. So this is not an ad, but Reese and I buy endangered species chocolate. Is that is that actually the name of it? Uh, maybe. I think so. I think it might be. Basically, it hooks us because it has pictures of charismatic megafauna on them. Yeah, totally. I have no idea what like flavor we're buying. No. Even I just out like I'll buy the wolf cuz I like it. The leopard. We buy the leopard one a lot. The leopard one is good. I don't know what's... I, I honestly, I could not tell you what, like, what was special about it. <laughs> it's dark chocolate and something, but it's the leopard one. It's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you've seen those, then you have an idea of what some charismatic megafauna are. I can't think of any other ones in our part of the world. Oh, bald eagle. Bald eagle. What about like bears? Would, uh, would a bear be considered one? Oh, Yeah. Okay. We don't have a whole lot of bears in our area, but yeah. in the U.S., bears are a good example. Yeah. Uh, pumas or mountain lions are another one. The Canada lynx, sure. which is in Minnesota, and I think maybe parts of Wisconsin. Yeah, I don't know. But it's one of those things where we come from the mindset of being in North America, so we're not thinking of our animals as being unique. And I think that the United States especially it has sort of led the charge in this charismatic megafauna group. I don't want to call it a group, but the movement towards isolating specific species that we feel yeah. really strongly connected to is definitely a, an American thing. Well, we, we really like our, our branding, I think. It's, well, it's, it's all about branding. Yeah. Well, you know. And uh, you can't blame the researchers, especially for for using those charismatic megafauna as a device to to get funding. That that will no, have, but I think that effect. it's a cycle where people see charismatic megafauna and they want to study them. Yeah, because you don't. It's you don't. You mean get like money. versus other people or other species? Yeah, because mm. it's not like you go to an investor and say give me some money and I'll do research on whatever you want. Is that, I assume that was how it worked. <laughs> no. <laughs> so these people are picking charismatic megafauna. I mean, everybody wants to study wolves or tigers or elephants. Very few people want to study invertebrates. I mean, that's because wolves and tigers and elephants are awesome. And because you are part of the problem. <laughs> yeah, I'll admit to that. <laughs> but that's all I have to say about it. If you have more questions, recently I'd be happy to answer them. Drop them in the comments. We've yeah. got a Facebook page. We're on Instagram. Definitely. You <laughs> you say me and you would, would both be happy to answer, but I, I don't know if I have too many answers for you. Reese's answers are going to be more funny than my answers, but they'll yeah. probably be less accurate. I'll make some sort of, a, you know... A cultural reference and, and it'll be it won't be correct i think kelsey's answers will be accurate that's what you're looking for i appreciate that So the next segment that we're going to jump into is something called rocket surgery, basically where I discussed um, articles that I've come across in the realm of physics and astronomy and uh, technology, that sort of thing, things that, that I'm interested in. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, today we are going to be covering a topic called syzygy, uh, which is generally relating to astronomy. Um, it's, a, it's known as a straight-line configuration of three celestial bodies in a gravitational system. Um, basically, it, it comes from the, the Greek suzygos, meaning paired or yoked together. Uh, there's a couple of examples that we'll get into later, but it's essentially exploring the relationship between different planets and you know stars and that sort of thing. Mm, okay. Uh, this is all based on my research through Wikipedia, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Very official. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a couple ways that um, this can manifest itself. Um, w one thing is to, important to know is that these are all essentially observed um, from, uh, as observed from Earth, uh, because, of course, that is the perspective that we have. <laughs> um, 
And so there's two ways that this can manifest itself. One is conjunction and the other is opposition. Basically, conjunction is the meeting or passing of two or more celestial bodies that have the same right ascension as observed from Earth. Um, so basically, if you think of Earth as a giant protractor where the equator is like zero, okay. the zero angle, um, if you go up from there, whatever angle that it has, that's sort of the the considered the right ascension that it has. Okay. So would it be, would the North and South Pole, would those be considered like 90 degrees? I, I believe so, yeah, okay. in my limited knowledge on this subject. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my assumption. Um, please feel free to comment if I'm totally off base on this. <laughs> uh, but the, the idea behind planets in conjunction is that they have the same uh, right ascension, which essentially means that they're at the same uh, vertical, sort of same vertical space in the sky. They're, in, okay, so they're they would, in line. They would line up almost like... Gosh, has it been more than ten years? But there was a point in our in our growing up years where you could see three or four of the planets with the naked eye. You're talking about Mars and Venus. I believe so. Right, yeah. The blue. It's like you could see it with the blue and the red. And they were fairly close together. Yeah, but they yeah. were like stacked almost on top of each other. So with that, I think they're uh, in this in the same region of the sky but not necessarily in the, in a straight line oh i think i might be thinking of laura croft tomb raider <laughs> where in her childhood she can see maybe it's maybe it's not in her childhood but she can see all of the other planets lined up when yeah when the when the planets align that's when that, she brings the piece to the place yeah and they can like time travel and stuff right i yeah i think so it's been a while since <laughs> we've seen that movie yeah, yeah. But that is not what happens in real life. No. Well, you know, maybe. <laughs> Someday. If Disney has anything to say about it. <laughs> but I'm sorry, I didn't mean to derail you. Continue to talk about they line up vertically. That's when they're considered. Yeah, so it's it's all, that that would be considered um, syzygy. Okay. Is, is in Tomb Raider when they all line up. Uh, <laughs> And you can travel. And they say back Hollywood in time. isn't scientifically accurate. <laughs> so basically, it's when they it's when they all line up in the sky. Okay. Um, now opposition is when they are on opposite sides of a, of a celestial sphere observed from a given body, usually Earth. Um, so they'd be basically they'd be in opposite directions from Earth. Question. Yeah. Is that like an eclipse between the moon and the sun? Yeah. In the Earth, would that be considered oppositional? Yeah. Yes. And I'll, I will be getting to that shortly okay. here, actually. Um, and this is, this is from a more <laughs> credible source. Uh, that's Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, actually. The Brits. Did, yeah, the, yeah. I cracked that one open uh, rather than Googling it. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> it's not an online encyclopedia. We own all of the Encyclopedia Britannica. We do. Yeah. Anyways, w one thing to bear in mind when it comes to syzygy, though, is that although these objects appear perfectly opposite or um, perfectly in line in the night sky, a lot of times they're they're nowhere even near each other. Uh, oh, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you look at I think your earlier point with Mars and Venus is although they look, you know, like they're probably right next to each other or whatever, um, they're different distances from the Earth, you know, they're different sizes, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so sort of the moral of this, this story is that it, it depends a, a great deal on perspective. As does everything in the right. world. Yeah, exactly, which kind of leads me in, into some of the... Um, some of the examples that are that are not necessarily from astronomy. Reese, this is a science podcast. Yeah, exactly. Let's, so let's get back to Disney. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in, in philosophy, there's a few there's a few examples of this. Um, it, it's really sort of used uh, to mean a union or relationship between seemingly unrelated things. Uh, you know, it's very metaphorical. I think in terms of that you know, seeing those celestial bodies in the night sky, but also using that as an example of 
of relationships between, you know, people. And Could it be like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon? It's yeah, I think that would that would fall very neatly into there. But that's a that's for another podcast, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, th- there's a couple of philosophers, prominent philosophers, that have gone into this more sp- uh, specifically. Vladimir uh, Solovyov, good Russian. <laughs> Using my Russian is good. yes, your Russian okay. is good. It's terrible, I'm sure. Um, but he used it to denote a close union. Um, well, Carl Jung sort of used it to mean the union of opposites. So you see sort of that dichotomy here in the philosophical examples too, in that it's, they may not necessarily be closely related or they are seemingly closely related, even though they're not obviously right next to each other, like Mars and Venus. Do you have an example of maybe in popular culture how that would apply like I, I in my mind I'm kind of picturing like the good versus evil dichotomy yeah that's that's a pretty good yeah any of these you know the myriad of superhero movies that are coming out right now where it's like um it, it would be like Superman and Lex Luthor where they're they're in complete opposition but that constitutes a relationship between the two of them right I would say they're pretty closely connected yeah definitely okay that and makes it's sense. Al- it, it almost becomes sort of a uh, mutual relationship between the two of them because they are they depend on each other to be able to do their thing right like if if lex luthor wasn't around there wouldn't be as much you know there wouldn't be an evil genius tr- trying to throw off superman right clark kent would just be writing about you right. know, the 25 cutest puppies yeah right. exactly you'd be working for buzzfeed right yeah um, so the sort of the classic um, examples of of syzygy in astronomy it would be like a the eclipse, like you mentioned earlier. Um, the solar eclipse is is a a good uh, <laughs> a good a good a clay just a just a hoot nanny. In case you have not noticed, Reese and I are both from the Midwest. Yeah, good. so you'll be getting some yeah. pretty great vernacular. Oh yeah, real good, real good. The solar eclipse of, is a type of eclipse that occurs when the moon passes between the sun and the earth uh, and when the moon fully or partially blocks out the sun. Um, of course, the lunar eclipse being when the moon passes directly behind the earth into its shadow. So solar eclipses would be uh, considered like under that conjunction and lunar eclipses would be in opposition. Oh, okay. So because with the lunar eclipse, it includes all three the sun, the earth, and the moon. Well, they, they both do. Whereas but, in a solar eclipse, we're just viewing it from Earth. Well, both, you're viewing it from Earth. I know, but I, I'm saying that without the Earth, you couldn't have a lunar eclipse. Yeah. Whereas you could easily have a solar eclipse with just the sun and the moon. That's true. The I think the difference comes in where um, you need some, you need to have the perspective from okay. the earth in both situations yeah. to constitute the relationship. So anyway, it's basically uh, relationships between celestial bodies, and it's very metaphorical for us as human beings, I think, too. I think there's probably a pickup line in there, too. Yeah. Something about celestial bodies and yeah. lining up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to workshop that. <laughs> Catch us next time on Reese and Kelsey Figure Out Science Pickup Lines. <laughs> Well, that's all we have for you today. If you enjoyed what we talked about, if you want to learn more, I implore you to look at the links in our bio. We provide all of the links to where we got our information. I do quite a bit of research through scientific papers, and I'll include the ones that I can. Some of them you might not be able to access, but I'll do my best. Yeah, and I'll, uh, of course, provide links to Wikipedia. Reese's links will be easier to understand. (laughs) That's probably true. But if you're interested, we're on iTunes. Nope, we're not. But we will be soon. Soon. We yeah. are on Facebook. SoundCloud. SoundCloud. Instagram. Yeah. And if you have suggestions for things that you want us to cover in the future, or if you have any questions about what we covered today, please leave comments on all of those media. 
Absolutely. We'd be happy to continue this conversation. And as I always like to say, we are happy to have you along this journey as we continue to learn about things that we know very little about. Definitely. Yeah. That's, that cannot be stated enough. (laughs) We are not experts. (laughs) No, we just like talking about this stuff. We just like talking. Yeah. Well, do you have anything else today, Kels? I've got nothing more to add. Me neither. Well, once again, I'm Kelsey. And I'm Maurice. And thank you for listening to Charismatic Megafauna. (laughs) 